Hey guys, my name is Annika, and this is chapter 19 of Holt Physics, which covers magnetism. This is the last chapter of the textbook that I'll be covering in this video series, because the future chapters, which cover electromagnetic induction, atomic physics, and subatomic physics, are not featured in AS Physics at MA. This chapter is going to be broken down into three videos. First, we'll look at magnets and magnetic fields. Second, I'll go over magnetism from electricity. And third, we'll move on to magnetic force. This video focuses on section 19.1, which is magnets and magnetic fields. So here we have your basic magnet. For the purposes of this chapter, we'll be treating all magnets as solid bars with two ends. These ends are called the poles. As you can see, this magnet has a north pole and a south pole. The names of the poles refer to the direction that the poles would point based on Earth's magnetic force. So when you have a magnet and a compass, the north pole will always point north and the south pole will point south. Magnets are similar to electric charges in that like magnets will always repel and opposite magnets will attract. However, unlike electric forces, magnetic poles can't be isolated into just a north pole and just a south pole. Basically what this means is that all magnets will always have two poles, even if you cut them into smaller pieces. Magnetic force is caused by the alignment of atoms within a material. In most materials that aren't magnetic, the magnetic fields of the atoms line up to cancel one another out. So an example of this would be in a substance such as wood or rubber, which is not attracted to a magnet. However, in substances that are said to be ferromagnetic, the atoms align to form magnetic domains, which are regions composed of atoms whose magnetic fields are aligned in the same direction. So the way this would look if we have these atoms is the fields would all line up to point the same way, giving this magnetic domain a magnetic force. That's how objects become magnetic. An example of ferromagnetic materials would be iron, cobalt, and nickel. There are two main types of magnetic materials. The first is known as a hard magnetic material, for example, cobalt. These materials are more difficult to magnetize, however, their magnetic domains, domains still exist after external magnetic field has been removed. So cobalt can remain magnetic even if the source of its magnetic force has been taken away. By contrast, soft magnetic materials such as iron cannot ma maintain a magnetic field once the external field has been removed. However, these materials are more easy to magnetize in the first place than hard materials. When magnetic force is present, it forms a magnetic field. This is sort of similar to the concept of an electric field that we learned about before. Magnetic fields are defined as regions where magnetic force can be detected. So I've drawn below a wire with a surrounding magnetic field. Magnetic fields are vector quantities, so they have magnitude and direction. And we'll learn more later on about how to calculate the direction in which a magnetic field is moving. To describe the strength of a magnetic field, we use magnetic flux. This is defined as the number of field lines that cross a certain area. The equation for magnetic flux is phi sub m, or flux, over here on the left side, equals a b cosine theta, where a is the surface area, and b is the magnetic field component normal to the plane of the magnetic surface. Now let's look at some practice problems. Number one, identify which sets of magnets will attract one another and which will repel. So I explained previously that magnets with like poles will always repel, whereas opposite poles will attract. So that would mean that we need a north pole and a south pole next to one another in order for the magnets to attract. So in the case of A, we have south and north next to each other. This means that the magnets will attract. In B, however, we have two south poles next to each other, making the magnets repel. C and D use horseshoe magnets, which is a slightly different and more complex way of constructing a magnet than just the solid bar that we've learned about before. However, these magnets work the same in that like ends will always repel and opposite ends will attract. So as you can see with C, we have two norths and two souths in contact with one another. This means the magnets will repel. Finally, in D, we have a north next to a south and a south next to a north, making the magnets attract. Number two, when you break a bar magnet in half, how many poles will each piece have? So we're starting out with a simple bar magnet with a north and a south pole. And I sort of went over this situation on a previous slide. So essentially what they're asking is if you break this magnet in half, 
you have these two pieces. How many poles will each section have? It might be intuitive to say that this end will only have a north pole and this end will only have a south pole, but as I explained earlier, no matter how much you cut a magnet in half, it will retain both of its poles, so each piece will have two poles, a north and a south.